All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Center for Global Development. Thanks for being here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Justin Sandifer, and I'm a senior fellow here at CGD. Uh, and we have a really exciting panel here for you today. We're just on the heels of kind of an all-day conversation with a number of people working uh, on the general topic of girls' education and women's empowerment. Um, and so we wanted to then kind of move to the end of the public portion of that event, um, which is going to kick off uh, with a presentation by my colleague, Pam Jaquila, who is a, also a senior fellow here at CGD. Um, she works on education, on gender, on uh, economic empowerment and uh, livelihoods opportunities, in addition to her long background as a behavioral economist uh, doing lab experiments uh, and experiments in the field more recently. Um, so really excited to have Pam here, as well as a panel um, that I'm going to introduce uh, after Pam's presentation, which will be about 15 to 20 minutes. We'll have a conversation here up front and then open up uh, to questions from, from all of you. Um, so without further ado, Pam, over to you. Thank you very much, Justin. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you everyone for coming today. Um, oops, sorry, we skipped ahead. Uh, okay. Every person in this room is passionate about girls' education. Uh, we're all trying to find the most effective ways to improve educational outcomes for girls uh, and to expand their opportunities in adulthood. We all have the same objective, but that doesn't mean that we necessarily agree on why girls' education is so important or how we should try to address gender gaps and improve educational outcomes for girls. So what I'd like to do in this presentation is to review a few empirical facts about girls' education and gender gaps. So I hate to disappoint you, uh, I'm not going to be presenting any facts that are original or surprising. Uh, my aim is, to, is not to wow you with new information. What I want to do is review what we already know about gender gaps in education. And hopefully this can motivate the subsequent discussion uh, by giving us a shared body of common knowledge about where we stand and what we still need to do to achieve gender equality inside and outside the classroom. So let me start. Women worldwide are more educated today than at any point in history. In 1960, there were 439 million women with no formal schooling in the uh, 146 countries covered by the Barrow-Lee Educational Attainment data set, which is what I'm going to be describing today. 47% uh, of women in the world had no schooling 60 years ago. Uh, and in more than half the countries, the average years of educational attainment by women was less than two. By 2010, less than 8% of adult women had no formal schooling. Uh, and the average level of education had increased to about eight years. Uh, so we've made a huge amount of progress in educating women and girls, as we're all aware. In fact, we've made a huge amount of progress in educating both girls and boys. So what you can see on uh, the right here is what the distribution of average educational attainment looked like across countries uh, for women, for women and for men in 1960. And you can see it's shifted over here uh, quite substantially. So women had an average of... Uh, Three years of schooling in 1960, that's up to almost eight. Men had an average of four years of schooling in 1960, and that's up to uh, eight and a half by 2010. So we've made a huge amount of progress on educating girls, and we've also made a huge amount of progress on educating boys. And when we look at the country level, what we see is that these have tended to move together. So these are the trajectories of, let me see if this works. No, the, does work. So these are the trajectories of individual countries. And you can see that almost all the countries are basically moving up the 45 degree line. So in almost all the countries, we see that women are, are gaining in education as men are gaining in education across uh, birth cohorts. You can see a few countries here where that have kind of gone off the trajectory. So Afghanistan, Togo, India, these are outliers where the gender gap in education has really gotten worse over the last 60 years. Uh, but for the typical country, what we've seen is increases in girls' education and boys' education that have really moved together. So you can see this. Uh, you can take a slightly different look at this same pattern here. So what this is showing you, these sort of green spaghetti noodles in the back, are the trajectory of women's educational attainment in every country. And you can see in every single country in the data set, women's educational attainment has increased a lot over the last uh, 60 years. Uh, when you look at the 
change in gender gaps, though, so the difference between how much education girls ha women have minus how much education men have, we see that it's a much more mixed picture. So particularly, you see that it was really holding steady or, if anything, getting a bit worse until somewhere in the 1980s. And since then, things have started to get better across a range of countries. But there are countries, so 106 out of 146 countries, we've seen sh the gender gap shrinking over the last 60 years. And in the remaining countries, it's gotten worse. So we've seen much more mixed progress when we think about whether women are catching up to men in terms of their educational attainment. And we see that when we look at the distribution of gender gaps. So this light distribution in the back is where we stood in 1960. Now in 2010, so you see a lot of the mass of this distribution has shifted to the right. So that's gender gaps are getting smaller. But it now essentially looks bimodal. What's going on here is that a fifth of the women in the world live in India and Pakistan, where gender gaps in educational attainment have, if anything, gotten larger over the last 60 years. So we can see that there's a lot of progress on getting girls and boys into school and women and men educated, but much less progress on closing gender gaps. Which brings us to the second fact that is, even though this is true, gender gaps rarely persist in countries that are highly educated. So what I've done in this figure is I've grouped countries into four categories uh, in 1960 and then again in 2010. So we can think about whether a country is highly educated or not, and specifically whether the men in a country have an average level of education that is above or below eight years of schooling, so whether most men have completed primary school or not. And then you can also think about conditional on the amount of schooling that men have, how, much, how far behind are women. So the gender gap countries here are countries where uh, are countries where women are more than a year behind the men. So the first thing that we see here is that there are a lot more high education countries in 2010 than there were in 1960, so we already know that. And that the biggest growth has been in countries that have high levels of education and very small gender gaps. So that's where a lot of countries are going. Obviously, developed countries are typically in there. But a lot of low and middle income countries have also moved into this high education, no gender gap space. And that's really, we see that that's really the only absorbing state. So these are coming from all different categories in 1960, they're moving into this state where there's high education with small gender gaps, and they don't move out of it again. Once a country reaches that state, it stays there. And then the second thing we see is that if we look at countries that have high levels of education for men, but big gender gaps, they're just very, very rare. So in 2010, there were only seven countries where that was true. And I'll talk about some of these as specific, specific cases. These are very uncommon. So when we think about countries that have gender gaps, we're also thinking about countries that have relatively low levels of education for men, so level, low levels of education among boys. When we look at where countries, how countries end up in 2010, either having low education but no gender gap or low education and a big gender gap, we see is there's a lot more churning among the countries that continue to have low levels of education. So we see some countries where there's a low level of education, there didn't used to be a gender gap, and now there's a gender gap. We also see the opposite, countries where there's still a low level of education, there was a gender gap in 1960 and it's disappeared. We see a lot more movement into and out of uh, having gender gaps at these low levels. But once a country gets to a high level of education, almost always that gender gap disappears. And so the point here that I really want to emphasize is that when we're thinking about places that still have gender gaps in educational attainment, we are also thinking about places where there, are, there is a low level of education among men. So to put that differently, we're thinking about places where girls are out of school these are also places where there are a lot of poor and vulnerable boys who are also out of school. And so when we think about what we can do to reduce gender gaps in education, it's also really important. It's important to target girls and to think about girl-specific constraints. But it's also think, important to think about uh, how we can target poor and vulnerable boys so that everyone moves up together, when we, whether we're thinking about this from an equity perspective or a sustainability perspective, trying to target girls when boys are also, poor boys are also really struggling is probably not going to be productive. It's not going to get us where we want to go on its own. 
So the next fact I want to point out, and this is a really nice thing about using this Barrow Lee educational attainment data set that I'm talking about today. This is data it's for 146 countries, but it goes back to 1960. So it's based on national censuses, and it gives us representative information on educational attainment uh, across these countries. And so we can really look back at the historical trajectory of gender gaps and educational trends. And so the thing that I want to, that really jumps out when you look at this is that things often get worse in terms of gender gaps before they get better. Okay, and so you can see this, I've just plotted the averages. This is the change in the gender gap in years of schooling between 1960 and 1985. And this is across regions. I've left out North America because it's a relatively wealthy region. And so what you notice is that in the three regions that in 1960, had really low levels of education for men and for women. So that's the Middle East and North Africa, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. You see that between 1960 and 1985, things got much worse. So there were these big increases in the gender gap. In the regions that in 1960 had more schooling, so average years of schooling among men were, was at least two or four years of schooling, we see much smaller changes. Things weren't improving dramatically, but they weren't getting worse. So in these regions, we see that they were really getting worse. And then when we look at what's happened since, so 1985 to 2010, now we see that the tide seems to have turned. So in every region of the world, the gender gap in educational attainment is getting smaller. So what can explain this? Well, one story here is that when you're in a low education environment, uh, you, you start with a, a situation where poor families aren't sending any of their kids to school. And then you might see educational gaps decreasing among the wealthy, but as the poor families start to send someone to school, they might send the boy first. So this might make the gap get uh, larger in the short run, and then it will eventually go away. And so that's what we see in the data. Now, I think I want to I stop and put facts two and three together to think a little bit about those countries that still have large gender gaps. So there aren't that many of them, OK? So there are 33 countries total in this data set that still have large gender gaps as of 2010. And so what, you, what I've highlighted here is that about half of them are what the World Bank classifies as fragile and conflict-affected states, OK? So many of those countries where we still see gender gaps they're not only situations where we see gender gaps, girls are behind, and there's also low educational attainment for men, uh, many out of school boys. They're also countries that have bigger problems, problems that go beyond the educational sector. And so when we think about how we can overcome the problem of a gender gap uh, in these countries, we need to think about programs and policies that not only go beyond girls, but also go beyond the school. The school is the only region that needs, inter the only sector that needs intervention to more holistically try and address the complicated situation facing ch vulnerable children in fragile and conflict-affected states. Now, when we look at the other set of countries, so the remaining countries that still have gender gaps, we see some evidence for this story that things get worse and then they get better. So I've kind of split the country, the remaining countries up. So this includes the post-conflict states, but not the currently uh, fragile and conflict-affected states. And what you see is that we see kind of two groups that cover almost all of the countries. So in one group, it seems like even though there is still a gender gap as of 2010, we've turned the corner. OK, so these are countries where gender gaps are getting worse and worse until about 1980 something or 1990. And now in countries like Bolivia and Ghana and Cambodia and Nepal, Tunisia, we've seen gender gaps declining quite steadily since. So those are countries where, not on its own, through the work of advocates and researchers and policymakers, gender gaps have started to decline. And we're on track to see gender gaps disappear by 2030. Now, there's another batch of countries that also look like maybe they've turned a corner. If you squint here, you can see these countries are now sloping up, but it's much more recent. So the change, the gender gaps have only just started to get smaller since about 2000. So we're looking at countries like Benin and Niger, Pakistan, Sierra Leone. These are countries where we're now on a positive trend, but we only just got there. So, what this, is, what this all comes together to say is that a lot of countries, in a lot of countries, we've really started to successfully address gender gaps in educational attainment, enrollment, and it's time to move on to other types of problem. And the countries where gender gaps are remaining, that are stuck in this low education equilibrium, often have many things going on beyond the education sector that we need to address as well.
So as we move on beyond attainment, we start to think about other ways in which girls may be left behind or disadvantaged within the educational system. So girls face a lot of different complicated challenges to overcome in school. They may, may be discriminated against by teachers. They may be exposed to gender-based violence. There are disparities in their responsibilities at home. One thing that's often discussed is the learning gap. So the idea that for many of these reasons, girls may go to school but get less human capital out of it. They may learn less by going to school. And so the fact that I want to emphasize, the learning gap is very important, but I want to emphasize that it's also really hard to measure a learning gap. Okay, so sometimes you see discussion of a learning gap that says, you know, okay, we tested kids in fourth grade, girls are behind boys, and so that shows that there's a learning gap. But it's not that easy to measure a learning gap. And there are some specific statistical reasons why. So bear with me while I geek out for a minute. But you can think about kids going to school where you have kids who vary in ability. So low ability kids are these light circles. High ability kids are these dark circles. You have the girls in pink, the boys in blue. Forgive me for that uh, cliche. So when all the kids are in school, we can just look at the average, say, fourth grade test score. And maybe that tells us something about whether girls are learning more than boys. But in the presence of an enrollment gap, where only some girls go to school, then we can no longer make that sort of comparison. So girls are going to be doing badly, or maybe depending on how, they decide, how households decide who goes to school, maybe they'll be doing better than boys for two reasons. One is any learning gap, and the other is selection into who goes to school. So as soon as you've got an enrollment gap, it becomes statistically very hard to know whether there's a learning gap. It may be very important, but it takes a lot of statistics to try to say anything meaningful about that. Now, it's actually worse than that because learning is a change, OK? So learning is about you start school, you end school, how much have you learned? So learning happens in a value-added context. But often, we're thinking about comparing are girls doing better than boys on achievement measures. So there are a number of reasons we might think that girls are uh, that girls and boys are in a different space when they come into school. So most obviously, there is some evidence that uh, girls, that households may invest less in their girls before they enter school. So uh, there's some work in India looking at how long parents breastfeed their children, finding that mothers stop breastfeeding girls earlier than boys. So we might be worried that girls are actually coming in at a disadvantage relative to boys because of household investments. Now on the other hand, uh, and what we know from studies of child development is that girls develop a bunch of test-relevant skills earlier in life. So they come in, you know, in an environment where they're getting equal investments, they're going to come into kindergarten or first grade with more skills, more things like pre-literacy skills because of the trajectory they're on developmentally. So both of these issues, so this selection into school and this fact that learning is a change and not a level, make it statistically really hard to look at achievement data and know whether girls are at a disadvantage in terms of learning. You have to do quite complicated statistics. Now, the good news is we can do this. Uh, and in fact, there's more good news that I'd like to show you, that in fact, the evidence on what households are doing is relatively reassuring. So I know I'm running over time, so I'll be quick. But this is evidence about the amount of childhood stimulation received in 75 countries in UNICEF's mixed data by girls and boys. And you can see that in this outcome, uh, gender gaps are really, really small. And we see the same thing if we look across a range of data sources at enrollment in preschool. So there's plenty of evidence that gender gaps in or in, in a number of, of dimensions in terms of household investments are much smaller than, for instance, what you see in the bottom, which are gaps by, by socioeconomic status. But even if that's true, we can't assume that these gaps aren't there. And so we need to do things to be able to say more concretely whether there are actually learning gaps reflecting changes in learning over time. OK, so the last thing that I'm going to say, and I think I am running quite a bit. Am I, how am I on time? A bit over, OK. So the last thing I want to say, which is obvious, it's something we all know, but sometimes we forget when we get caught up talking about girls' education, is that gender equality in education is simply not enough to achieve equality outside of the classroom. And so we're often, often tempted, we know that it's not enough in some sense, but we're often tempted to say things like, well, surely equalizing outcomes in the classroom is going to have some impact on empowerment. So what I'm showing you here is changes uh, in the relationship, so I'm looking at changes in the gender gap and changes in the gap in labor force participation. 
So this is only over the last 25 years because that's as far back as the labor force participation go, data go. But what you can see is that there's no relationship. So these, so women catching up to men in terms of education does not lead to women catching up to men in terms of their participation in the labor force. These things are basically uncorrelated. So there are a lot of things that we do know change women's participation in the labor force or are correlated with their participation in the labor force about uh, norms of equality and culture. But education alone, removing inequality in education, is simply not going to do it. That's what we can see in the data. Um, OK, so those are my five facts. So when we think about what we can actually do to help women and girls achieve their full potential in life, uh, we need to start thinking about what happens outside of the classroom, both in childhood and in adulthood, and the constraints that women face that are preventing them from controlling their destinies and using their human capital once they leave school. So we need to start thinking not only about girls and not only about classrooms, but about whole communities inside and outside of school. Thank you very much. Assigned seating. <laughs> All right. Pam, thank you for kicking us off with a colorful presentation. Um, literally, uh, great graphs. Um, OK, so let me introduce our panel here. Um, and I'll try to go in the order that's in front of me. Um, so to my immediate right, Stephanie Saki is Deputy Director of the Population Council's Girl Innovation and Research Learning Center. Girl Center. I should have just gone for the acronym. So thank you, Stephanie, for joining us from New York. Um, to her right, uh, we have Kenny Ajayi, who is an economist in the Africa region and the Gender Innovation Lab. Do you guys say Jill or Gil? I say Jill. You say Jill. Jill. That, that, that has a bit of rhyme to it. So the Gender Innovation Lab at the World Bank, and he was previously a professor uh, of economics at Boston University. Um, to her right, uh, we have Dana Schmidt, who is Senior Program Officer for Echidna Giving, uh, where she leads grant making on early childhood development and adolescent skills and mindsets. Um, and before Echidna, she was with the Hewlett Foundation. Um, moving on further to the right, Christina Kwok is a fellow at the Center for Universal Education um, at the Brookings Institution. And she manages a program, uh, the Echidna Global Scholars Program, uh, as you'll see the connection, uh, and chairs the Girls' Charge Initiative. Um, and so we'll hear more about that uh, in a minute. Um, and then Pam, who we already heard of, heard from. Um, okay, so let me, where should we start this off? Um, let me start with Stephanie. Um, so you have just, you know, we're, we're, the title of the event was Beyond Getting Girls in School, an unfinished business. Um, here in the development space, um, I think there is a lot of enthusiasm. I mean, girls schooling is the one intervention everybody you know, can get enthusiastic about. It's, you know, it solves everything. Uh, um, and you've just finished a, a systematic review of papers that try to get really you know, serious and rigorous about the causal inference there on the returns to girls schooling, especially for like sexual and reproductive health. Um, so tell us a little bit about that and uh, rain on our parade a little bit. That's <laughs> what researchers like to do. So um, thanks. And thanks to CGD for organizing all of us here. Uh, so if I can just say for a second that um, what we do at the mm -hmm. Girls Center, because I think it's relevant to this work. Um, so we just launched the Girls Center at the Population Council a couple of years ago. And we saw a couple gaps that we're trying to address. And one is um, just the, the disconnect often between research and practice and work that's happening for adolescents globally. Um, and related to that is often the disconnect between different disciplines in terms of the work that's happening for adolescents. Um, and so one of the areas that we really have been focusing on quite a bit is this link between education and health. And so coming into that question, um, we looked at the evidence and thought, surely, you know, people talk so much about how education leads to all these benefits for health, so surely we have really solid evidence to support that. Um, and it turns out that there was not a systematic review out there. So we did one that we have just published, actually, 
Um, it's just out in the, in the last couple of days with support from the Gates Foundation. Um, and, and so as you kind of alluded to, one of the challenges in really getting at this relationship is that we would expect education and health to be related for a lot of different reasons. So girls who come from wealthier households are more likely to go to school. They're also likely to have, for example, better nutrition during childhood, and that leads to better adult health outcomes. So um, of course, we would expect that more educated girls and more educated women are likely to be healthier women. That's also true at the national level that governments make kind of similar types of decisions about investing in these systems. Um, so there's lots and lots of evidence out there that shows that these two things are correlated. And we wanted to really focus in on causal relationships. So does education actually cause improvements in health? Um, so we did a systematic review. We found more than 7,000 papers, read through them or skimmed through them, and ended up with a pool of 45 papers that met these criteria. Um, and so I would say the results are kind of mixed. On the good side, we found that there is strong evidence that, there, that, that more educated women who complete more years of schooling have lower fertility, um, are less likely to be HIV positive, and are less likely to have a child who dies. Um, so that's wonderful news. On the other hand, we looked at a whole other set of outcomes where we found no effect on average, even though there was quite a bit of research looking at these relationships. So those include age at first sex, age at first birth, age at marriage, use of contraception, neonatal, and infant mortality. Um, so just to be clear, there was plenty of evidence looking at these. And on average, there was no significant effect of more years of education on these outcomes. So we've spent a lot of time thinking about why that might be true and can definitely talk more about that. But I think the other really important finding is that, um, first of all, we found almost no studies that looked at the effects of learning, literacy, or numeracy on health outcomes, which, um, if you're familiar with the theory on these relationships, is really at the core of what we think is important. So that's a huge gap, and that might be really what answers the question. We also found very little evidence for the effects of men's education. Uh, we found nothing on the effects of education on malaria, very little on maternal morbidity and mortality. So there are a lot of really important gaps in the literature. But overall, I would say the relationships are not as strong and not as consistent as we often assume they are, both in research and in practice. Hmm. So that, there's, there is this kind of tension, I think, in the, at the top line kind of global education debate at events like this between Girls' education is the greatest investment in global development, and I'm sure we'll have an event tomorrow here about there's a learning crisis, and you know education <laughs> systems are failing, and these things sit in some awkward tension. This yeah. isn't the way I was hoping we we're going to resolve that tension, but you're pointing to kind of uh, some resolution there that you know lower quality systems are not producing some of the benefits that we we would hope. Um, let me jump around here a little bit um, and jump to Dana. Um, and so you work at a philanthropic foundation who invests in global education, broadly defined. Um, and I have a feeling if you you know, have to de describe it to the person sitting next to you on the flight out here from the Bay Area, they would assume, oh, that's great. You pay to get girls into school, right? But that's not mostly what you do, right? And you do, guys do lots of work on social norms and other more nuanced dimensions of girls' schooling. Tell us a little bit about what you actually do and how you, how the foundation chose the path that it's chosen. Sure. Um, first of all, I try not to talk to people on flights, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. <laughs> um, no, so, um, so as you said, our Echidna Giving is a philanthropic fund that's focused on girls' education. And as we were trying to determine um, the strategy for our work, we really looked at a lot of the evidence that Pam presented and had an understanding that, you know, there, um, despite, I think, popular um, perception, there has been tremendous progress in terms of um, attainment in girls' education and closing of those gaps. Um, but we were really interested in some of the questions that um, Stephanie was just raising in terms of what actually is the experience in school and what are girls gaining out of that experience that can actually shift um, their life outcomes. Um, and so a big area of emphasis in our strategy is really looking at what are the sets of skills and mindsets that are critical for girls to succeed both within school and, um, and beyond. 
And we're thinking about those at two stages in a girl's life cycle. Um, one, around early childhood, which we know is a critical um, period, both in terms of cognitive development, but also in terms of shaping of norms um, for young children and what they see as gender norms. And so we're thinking about what happens in those early years um, that's supportive of um, greater gender equality down the line and sort of how early in the life of a girl can you intervene effectively to set her on a different trajectory. We're also thinking about adolescence, um, which again is another critical moment um, when girls are um, sort of subject to a different set of norms often and thinking about then at that stage in life, what set of skills and mindsets that maybe go even beyond just the traditional academic outcomes um, that get to things like agency and self-awareness and decision-making, negotiation, problem-solving that might support a girl not only in success academically but also um, in success um, beyond life and being able to navigate and make her own decisions. Um, so, some, so those are some of the issues that are really central in our strategy and I think in large part because um, there are a lot more open questions about how we do that well. Um, and, and so we're trying to invest in folks who are working on solutions and who are working on research to build the evidence um, in those areas. Can you give us an example? Your favorite program in this space? Favorite program, that's, you know I have two grantees on the panel I, I with realize. you, Justin. <laughs> Never mind that. So I will, pick a, I will pick a different program. Um, we were talking uh, earlier today about um, if we talk, think about some of the programs that actually try to think more intentionally about shifting norms, we've been supporting an organization in India called the Study Hall Education Foundation um, that's really trying to directly um, tackle the question of gender and power through its curriculum and, and what's taught in the classroom. Um, they run a couple of their own schools where their teachers facilitate these conversations directly with students about um, you know, what issues they face because of their gender, how that shows up in their life, how things should be. Um, as they work more broadly in the school system, this starts with conversations with teachers um, to help teachers actually understand where gender and power shows up in their lives uh, to then translate into how they interact with their students in the classroom. Um, and they're thinking about this not only for um, girls, but also for boys, um, because everyone is part of uh, the broader set of norms. So that's one example that's very concretely um, focused on um, gender norms and how you think about this. Excellent. Um, I think that's a good segue. I want to go to you, Christina. Um, so, I mean, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, what Girls Charge does. Um, but I want to also uh, jump off of something that Dana said, which I think relates to an interest of yours around life skills. Uh -huh. um, you've co-authored a book on what works in girls' education, evidence for the world's best investment. So this seems to have many of the answers to the, to the questions we're asking here today. Um, so tell us a little bit about Girls' Charge and particularly around this, this issue of if we were teaching more relevant skills and if, you know, if our school systems were teaching life skills well, would we be changing these returns that uh, Stephanie is worried about. Sure, thanks. So, um, so Girls Charge is actually a collaborative, um, a community of practice of over 60 organizations um, that work in girls' education, whether directly or indirectly. And so this particular collaborative, over the last couple of years, we started in 2014 as a, um, a global commitment to action under the Clinton Global Initiative. And over the course of the years, through our engagement with different um, girls' education NGOs, many of which were running programs in life skills education, we began to see um, a lot of noise around discussions about what are, what are the important skills that girls need in order to succeed in life, what are those, how, do, um, how do you design programs, how do you measure programs. And so this really kind of took us off on a, um, a multi-year journey. We're still in it. Um, and thinking about what are those life skills? How do we better, um, as a community of actors, think about design in a way that's not just targeting the development of critical skills, but also leads to transformative outcomes, so transformative social change in the girl's context, as well as in her own um, sort of uh, toolbox of um, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So in some of that work, um, we are really agnostic in terms of what those skills are, but we've found that you know, 
um, I think many of us would agree that literacy and numeracy is not enough when we're talking about trying to think about the kinds of skills that girls need in order to lead, success lead successful lives. And that really it's these broader skills, which in our space is typically talked about as life skills, in other places it's soft skills, in other places it's um, transversal skills, transferable skills, 21st century skills, and so on. But really the key there was what are the underlying core principles that actors need to be keeping in mind as they are developing programs from any sort of disciplinary approach, whether it's through workforce development, or if it's through health, or if it's through um, economic empowerment, or, or whatnot. And so really trying to understand kind of what are the underlying principles and components um, that programs should really be thinking of. So how do you define, or how do you identify, how do you target the kinds of knowledge, skills, and attitudes? How do you then think about the enabling context and the multiple contexts that girls are embedded in? And so that work has really led us to thinking about um, girls' skills, not only in the context of classrooms or non-formal environments, but also thinking about how they intersect and get us out of the education sector and thinking about other sectors. So thinking about the sectors in, in our, or my current obsession is thinking about girls' education and climate change. So how are the same kinds of skills that we're, that we're saying are important for girls to develop in order to thrive and navigate their complex um, uh, the complex environments, how are those same skills, the same kinds of skills that society needs in general to be able to t tackle complex problems like climate change? So it's kind of gone from one place and really demonstrated to us the interlinking uh, challenges and solutions that girls' education can po possibly pose as the entry point to. So let me ask a follow-up on that. I think this is maybe for both you and for Dana. Um, we're seeing kind of a, a budding literature on programs evaluating programs that are trying to shape social norms at school or trying to teach life skills or you know soft skills. Um, what do we know, particularly from the developing context, about the returns to those skills? I mean, the one thing is to say that we can change the needle on this. We've, we've created a new dial. It's not just literacy and numeracy. We've got other dials now. And we can come up with interventions to shift those dials. Um, do we have good causal evidence Back, I'm going to keep bringing it back to, you're going to fix Stephanie's coefficients for me. Do we, can we show that those things are going to lead to the returns we want in terms of labor market outcomes, income, social, sexual and reproductive health? Have, have we gone that far yet? Do you want to go for it first? Or? We're both shaking our head. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. Go for it. Uh, I guess I would say no, um, that there is uh, an emerging body of evidence largely from the U.S. and other um, uh, more economically developed context that suggest there are um, long-term returns. Um, think of Hanushek's work and, and others. Um, we don't have great evidence from other contexts yet. Um, and part of that is we uh, a lot of the skills that we're talking about, we don't have great measures for either. Um, and so I think there are a, a emerging set of studies that might say, yes, life skills programs have an effect, but often they're bundled with other things, and there's no disaggregation of which particular skills that, you know, it's kind of like a enters a black box, right? You and deliver a program that's life skills plus some cash for girls to go to school, et cetera, and out on the other side come better outcomes, but we don't actually know if that program changed any of those skills, or if simply, say, girls were to, you know, in safe spaces for a longer period of time, whether or not they learned anything uh, mm -hmm. in there. So I think there's a lot of work to be done to, um, to unpack how we measure some of those skills and, and be able to understand what happens in the black box. Um, okay. Yeah, go on, go on. I was going to take you somewhere else, but okay. go in on that one first. Yeah. And talk about some of the work uh, that we've done at the Africa Gender Innovation Lab, where our focus is really on understanding what types of programs and policies work to improve women's economic empowerment. Um, and specifically on that, we've um, got glimpses of some things that do work. One example, a recent example, is a study we did comparing um, the impacts of uh, traditional business training um, for um, female uh, business owners and personal initiative training, which uh, combines that with um, some uh, a focus on what we could think of as life skills, but um, some of these soft skills, uh, like uh, the importance of um, looking for opportunities to take initiative, um, to innovate, and not just the traditional business skills training that people tend to give. Uh, and this study found that there were bigger impacts of, there's a lot of work that's demonstrated that uh, traditional business skill training 
is, uh, tends to be disappointing in a lot of contexts. And um, this work and work that we're continuing in this area uh, suggests the importance of uh, or the value of infusing life skills in, in terms of improving the uh, performance of uh, micro or, or small scale entrepreneurs. Um, so that's one thing we've done. And we've also doing some more work trying to unpack these life skills um, pro programs to understand specifically what types of skills are more effective and uh, how can we measure them and how can we um, cultivate them. So if I can just jump in. You don't sound mic. You don't sound mic. Okay. Can you? Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I do think, though, we need to, I'd like to just sound a note of caution in that, light, I mean, first of all, I think life skills, there's plenty of evidence that so uh, soft skills are important, but whether there's evidence that you can teach them, it's quite mixed. So there are some success stories, but there are also a lot of youth-focused business skills interventions, entrepreneurship interventions that have been including life skills and been evaluated rigorously over the last decade, and many of those find no effects. So unless you think that the business training component is actually making girls worse off and then the life skills is fixing it, when we think about sort of doing a systematic review of these causal effects, we definitely want to be aware that there are a lot of things, at least masquerading as life skills, that do not seem very effective. And so it's really important to try to find and evaluate rigorously what are the approaches in this space that have been shown to work in specific contexts. Because there are a lot of things labeled as life skills that really seem to have very little effect. Um, okay, what I was going to ask you, Kenny, <laughs> was, uh, well, and I'll broaden it out a little bit, and others might want to jump in as well. Um, so in the sessions where all of you were with us in the morning, um, we ended the day on this session on uh, social norms, aspirations, and role models. Um, and we did, for the audience here, a little voting exercise amongst all the participants about what we thought the most pressing questions were. Um, and with a group of kind of education experts, it seemed like we decided that it, you know this wasn't the education sector's problem to solve. It was sort of, if we want to fix girls' educational aspirations, we need to fix the labor market you know, that they're heading out into. Um, and I kind of want to get people here to, to react to that a little bit. And you mentioned, Kenny, specifically some of the work that you folks are doing at the Gender Innovation Lab around trying to guide women's career and job choices, nudging people into more lucrative occupations. What, where is that happening? What are you doing? How's, what are the results from that show? Yeah, sure. So the starting point for that is the observation um, from a bunch of different contexts that women uh, tend to segregate into sectors that have uh, lower uh, returns, a lower, fewer opportunities for um, getting economic returns. Uh, and so uh, and when women do cross over into non-traditional sectors, um, they tend to have higher returns than women who are, or have higher income than women who uh, remain in stereotypical um, sectors. And um, to give you some concrete examples, uh, women tend to be less likely to be involved in um, things like construction industry, working in uh, uh, electronics, um, and working in like steel in industries and, and that type of thing. Um, and so, uh, and you also see this within the education system. So bring it back to education, you see that women tend to segregate in a lot of syst in a lot of contexts into certain fields of study compared to men. They're more likely to do home economics, they're more likely to do general arts, less likely to do sciences, technical studies, uh, and that sort of thing, even when they have the same uh, academic ability. Um, and that these choices early on in educational investments and in um, eventual uh, economic sector and employment decisions translate into women having uh, part of what we saw earlier. With, well, I guess you were showing labor force participation, but there's a lot of work showing that even in places where like, women have caught up in educational attainment, there's still a huge gap in income uh, and uh, employment security and, and labor market outcomes broadly. Uh, so taking that as a starting point, we've been um, doing some work trying to understand what determines whether women cross over um, and trying to see uh, what factors can be used to, or what interventions can be used to, to nudge women. Um, and some of the evidence of, I'll talk about, for example, a recent study using Facebook data um, from a future of, of business survey was basically finding that um, women who have 
uh, a connection to uh, business businesses and non-traditional sectors, so either have relatives who are in those sectors or have some kind of um, network from a male uh, relative or someone in their in their network are more likely to cross over. Um, so part of this segregation results from the fact that people have different social networks and less access to information about opportunities, know-how about engaging these opportunities. Uh, and But when you do provide women with information and nudges to get them into these sectors, they do end up um, earning more income than women who stay in the traditional sectors. Um, anybody else want to react to the, so uh, do we think we can uh, overcome, these nudges sound pretty powerful. We, we, we nudge people into the, you know, we've got huge labor force participation gaps. We've got huge earnings gaps conditional on labor force participation. Um, how far do you think nudges can go? Uh, and I should add before that we, we mentioned this earlier, that there's caveats that in a lot of contexts there are valid reasons why women don't go into these sectors, including um, in some situations concerns about um, you know, exposure to violence or um, you know, the difficulty in accessing credit or um, know-how. And so there's more than just giving information that is necessary, um, but in, there's clearly a suboptimal uh, allocation of women in, across different sectors and room for growth in that regard. Okay, um, let's pull back to a couple of the other uh, topics we discussed uh, earlier in the day. Um, we started off uh, this morning um, with a presentation from Sarah Baird, I'm not sure if Sarah's still around, who talked to us about um, unconditional and conditional cash transfers um, and some fairly kind of discouraging results that seems to be the theme of the day about, um, you know, about the ability to improve educational outcomes, um, to change kind of um, age of first pregnancy and, and so on. Um, I'm curious to hear what others took away from that session. Uh, I think there's a set of folks in the education, kind of global education uh, policy community who would say kind of we've, we've We've done cost barriers now, right? This is the area of, of free primary education and increasingly free secondary education as people brought up um, in, the, in the discussion. Um, and so we need to look beyond kind of cost barriers to other things now. Um, reactions to that, are we done with the cost agenda uh, or not? I mean, I'll partially jump in on that, but I think this is also related to this conversation, which is a broader theme that came up is um, talking about realistically what are the opportunities available and so I mean I suppose it's cost-benefit analysis in the words of the economist is that um, <laughs> the, on the part of the, the girls themselves um, you know but I so I think something that's interesting is actually in our data um, when we ask girls about their their educational aspirations they tend to be much higher than what is realistic so you know, almost 100% in some settings will say that they want to continue on to tertiary education in settings where almost no girls do. So, um, you know, and then there starts to be a transition in the aspirations and then expectations, I think, as they get older and realize what the costs are to schooling. But also, um, you know, what we talked about is the trade-offs in terms of marriage and childbearing, which I think is a really important part of this conversation when we're talking about girls and gender. Um, you know, marriage and childbearing is normative in many of the settings where we work and desirable for girls. Um, and so, but it also is incompatible with schooling and often incompatible with engaging in the labor market. Um, so part of this is about there being labor market opportunities available, which I think part of what we heard, if I'm translating it correctly, is that often in many settings they are not available to girls or boys, but also when they are available, um, how can that be balanced with the other choices that are also desirable to girls and young women, um, especially when the burden of child caring is on the women disproportionately? I guess it would be hard to say that we've eliminated the cost barriers, um, particularly at secondary, um, even at primary if you think about non-fee related costs. But um, sticking with the secondary picture, even if you look at you know, a country like Malawi, which recently eliminated tuition in secondary schools, that's a very small proportion of the cost of secondary school. Um, and so uh, what we didn't talk, as we talked a little bit about 
this morning, um, kind of the different design choices around conditional, unconditional cash transfers, how that can um, play a role. But we didn't talk as much about the broader financial picture within a given country and what's realistic in terms of eliminating some of the cost constraints. So I think that's a, a you know, where we have a sense that cost is still a constraint, that yes, there have been some um, big commitments and ways that we've rolled back costs. It's still a constraint in many places. It's not totally obvious to me um, that being able to completely eliminate costs for everyone all the way through secondary school is realistic. And so I think where we need more serious conversations around what is the design that's affordable and that would you know, target the right people. I think it's important to note that the progress we've made can be re reversed, right? So this isn't something that just happened on its own. Secondary school is providing free secondary school to everybody is very expensive, and there are still debates in the donor community about whether that should be a priority. And so I think we have plenty of evidence that families are more price sensitive when it comes to sending their girls to school than boys. And so we're making a lot of good progress, but that doesn't mean that we can completely take our eye off the ball because the progress we see could be reversed very quickly if governments stop prioritizing universal achievement of secondary school completion. Okay, maybe one more topic, and then I'm gonna so start preparing your questions because then I want to open it up. Uh, we've got a lot of people here, and I'm sure there's lots of questions in the audience. Um, we talked, we had a whole session earlier today on safety at school and getting to school, um, and we talked quite a bit about sexual violence at school. Um, and I'd just be curious. I know this is, you know, all of you were in the audience for that with me, and uh, nobody, I don't think, on the panel comes. Um, as a gender-based violence in school expert. Um, I'm sure we must have some in the room with a group this large. Um, but uh, you know, my sense from the discussion is that it's an area where we have some pretty staggering numbers um, about reported rates of violence in schools, but a lot of uncertainty about you know, the shakiness of those numbers and um, a little bit of an, an, an evidence gap in terms of um, what the repercussions of, of that is. Um, but I'm curious where you folks see the agenda there. Is it in measurement? Is it in program design? Um, is it something we're paying enough attention to? Or is it the hot issue of the moment and we need to move on? Um, curious what your reactions were to that, that discussion. OK, I'll start. <laughs> um, well, I think as we talked about, we need to know how to measure it in order to know whether the interventions are effective. But um, I mean, one thing I would say in general is that when we think about these interventions, we have to think about what the outcomes are and what success looks like. So um, it might not be the case, you know, we, there, are, there are many, many challenges in the school environments that we're talking about and many reasons why young people, especially girls, drop out of school. Well, I shouldn't say especially girls. Girls and boys drop out of school. Um, and so the idea that, um, widespread school violence is going to lead to school dropout in settings where people are dropping out of school for all sorts of reasons. If we're, if we're saying that unless that's happening, school violence is not important, then I think we're framing the question the wrong way. Um, so I think if we want to look at this as something that's very important and a violation of rights and maybe has very serious repercussions that may or may not be related to education right now, um, then also thinking about the way we evaluate design and evaluate interventions, um, should not be just looking at whether eliminating violence leads to improved school outcomes, but eliminating violence leads to improved mental health, health outcomes, adult well-being. Um, so I think framing the question is really important in settings with so many challenges. The other quick thing that I would say is that um, I think it's very, very important to be looking at violence in different domains of young people's lives and not to look only at violence in the school. In a lot of ways, young people who are in school especially by adolescents, are better off than young people who are out of school. Um, and so they might be experiencing violence in school, but those who are out of school might also be at high risk of violence. So I think we need to be looking at violence against young people and the different place, places in their lives and ways that they're experiencing it in our research and our interventions. The other reflection that I had um, coming out of that conversation is that it might be interesting to think about the places where the violence um, and the broad shift of shifting of larger norms intersect in terms of the intervention space. Mm -hmm. um, so I offered earlier the example of the work that Study Hall is doing in India around talking, you know, 
um, facilitating explicit conversations around um, gender norms. And I think there's evidence, um, although I'm shakier on this, so someone in the audience or on the panel can correct me if I'm wrong, but that some of that type of gender transformative programming is, um, is the type of programming that can also help to alleviate um, uh, gender-based violence. Um, so if we can think about, um, I think there might be spaces where those, those two nicely converge. One thing I would add to is um, this conversation reminds me of something that cuts across a lot of different interventions focusing on adolescence, and that's the potential for spillovers. So often uh, when we um, introduce uh, interventions around life skills or targeting uh, sexual-based violence, those types of things, it tends to be at a small scale focusing a small subgroup, maybe you know, 12 to 14-year-olds, or people in certain schools. It could be focusing on violence for kids enrolled in school rather than those dropping out. Um, and with those types of situations, it's very important to think about what happens to people who aren't targeted by those interventions. Um, and some of the work we've done um, on adolescent economic empowerment found that in some programs, um, you know, focusing on girls in certain age groups uh, leads to a shift in um, either uh, you know, sexual-based violence or uh, sexual activity from one group to another. Uh, and so it's really important. I think that's another reason why thinking about changing norms is important rather than um, just focusing on reducing the incidence of violence for a certain age group because in doing that, unless you make you think about it more holistically, there might be unintended consequences for other groups of, gir of girls or other populations that aren't the focus of mm. the intervention. Super interesting. Okay. Um, I think I want to open it up a bit, and um, so we're going to, before the sea of hand goes up, I think we're going to try to take them in rounds, and we're going to encourage people to get to uh, questions relatively briefly, but I'll gather a few of them and then throw them back to the panel. Uh, so I see a first hand here, the lady in the white blouse up in the second row, um, and yep, let's start there. Thank you so much. This is such an important conversation. I've been involved with um, girls' economic empowerment for the last 15 years at uh, Save the Children and International Youth Foundation, et cetera, so this is so important. Um, um, I, I was surprised uh, to hear you say, Pamela, that you know, the, the, the jury's out about whether life skills matter because from the, the research that we've seen and the research that we've done, um, actually employers need that. And anyone who wants to get an um, entry-level job needs to have the types of life skills that I know Christine is talking about in her program. Um, so I do think that that's still something up, I don't think it's up for debate anymore, frankly. Um, but my question to all of you guys are: is, we've talked about uh, gender gaps in education, um, we talked about cost of education. So, but I, th I think we were sort of learning around the issue of quality in education and returns on the investment to education. Um, you know, there are many ways to learn, and I'm wondering, in my many years of experience, whether really the best place to learn, especially at the secondary level, is in school. Or is it in much more targeted programs, maybe alternative um, education systems, second chance education systems, shorter term, more focused on you know, what is really gonna help these young women succeed in their lives, whether they choose to work or not. So I guess that's my question to you guys, is return on education, and are the best returns through schools, or are they through other types of interventions or programs, et cetera, or an ecosystem change or something? Sorry, it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Sam, can you go right behind you uh, in the pink? Yeah. Hi, thanks so much for this conversation. My name is Lindsay, I work at the Institute for Women's Policy Research, and um, so I'm coming from a bit, a bit of a different perspective. The research I lead is focused on helping mothers in the US access the higher education space and graduate successfully. So my question for you is, is there a conversation in the global space about how to improve access to education, either secondary or tertiary, for young women who become mothers at young ages, or even in their 20s at the typical college age, that's a conversation we're having more and more in the US space. How do, how do things like childcare open up access, in addition, not, not only to education, but also to these non-traditional occupation, um, occupations that can lead to higher earnings and families, family sustaining wages. So I'm just interested to hear your perspectives on that. Thank you. 
And then here in the back, yep. Hello, um, my name is Natalie Geismar, and I work on the Girls Ed team at Brookings. And I, my question is specifically for Stephanie. Um, I was wondering, uh, you spoke a lot about in the kind of systematic review that you recently published on an emphasis on shifting from correlation to causation in the link between uh, education and these various health outcomes. And I was just really curious about what that kind of looks like methodologically. You know, how do you take into account and control for kind of the wealth of contextual factors, um, you know, whether it's degree of parental stimulation at home, whether it's baseline socioeconomic status, that factor into this relationship that you are able to discern between levels of education and factors like lower rates of HIV prevalence and so forth. So if you could elaborate on that a bit, I would really like to hear. And let's actually do one more. I think we had a hand up front. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pierina. Um, I'm just here um, as a member of the public. Um, so um, my, my question is specifically for Kanid. Um, you had mentioned that women tend to isolate themselves into um, you know, working in the non-traditional sectors. And my question is, is there a global push in education to kind of enhance STEM-focused learning so that young women who obtain primary and secondary education are able to obtain um, or enter into those non-traditional sectors? OK. Um, sure, you guys all memorized those <laughs> verbatim. So um, I don't know who wants to start first. Um, uh, it's not that life skills aren't important. Life skills are very important. But there have been a lot of evaluations of programs that have a life skills component in them that have found zero overall effect. So it's much less clear if we can successfully teach life skills. And that varies across context and implementing organization and program that you do. And there are some evaluations of things that are life skills that are rigorous and show that they work. And there are many other contexts where people do things that are life skills interventions that have been shown not to work. And so I think we want to be careful. Life skills are definitely critical and soft skills. But whether we can teach them and what it takes to do so is much less clear. So um, some of the work that we're doing at Brookings right now is trying to target this, this question as a measurement piece. And I think part of the problem that in the literature is that we really don't know what we're measuring because we don't know how we're defining it. And I think there are other efforts around. Um, I'm thinking in particular Harvard's Easel Lab. They have this amazing taxonomy project that's looking at skills and how do you define the skills and how do you um, then like cross uh, or um, compare your particular skill with the same kind of skill but might have a different name in another field. And so I think part of the part of the measurement issue is the, it goes back to the definition issue. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things we're trying to do at Brookings is to try to determine, or not determine, but um, uh, assess what might be some kind of underlying principles, again, for measurement um, that might, might be able to help us better understand that link between the teaching of the skill, the defining of the skill, the, and then the measurement of the skill. So I think there's just a lot that we just don't know. Um, and the only space. thing I would add, I agree with everything you said, but once we do it in one language, mm -hmm. then it's com the measurement is completely different when you move to a different linguistic framework. So different, uh, different language groups define many of these kind of soft skills and even conceive of them completely differently. So if you go into the anthropology and the ethnography, you see that what works for measuring, you know, the big five works really well in a lot of rich country settings, and then you take it to a poor country setting, and suddenly it makes much less sense. Mm -hmm. And so I think, in, at least in some poor country settings, and so I think you have to be really careful about every time you do that, you need to do it within the cultural context where you're working. Absolutely. Uh, to weigh in on your second question around is schooling the best place for this, I, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. I, I think it's provocative to think about the, so the SDGs have this huge ambition that we're going to get everyone through secondary school. We're really far from that reality in a lot of places. Um, and so I think it's a really interesting question to think about what is it about schooling that leads or doesn't um, to some of the outcomes that we tout around girls' education, and can that be delivered um, through different modalities at a cost that's um, affordable? I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of space for innovation and not a, a lot of rich conversation about that as yet. I think it's an area where there should be more. I'll piggyback on that, on that same question. Um, and one thing, I guess two points I'd make on that. One is that 
uh, from the government's perspective, majority of their funding typically is focused on the formal education system. Um, and depending on the level you're at, that's where a lot of kids are. Um, and so I think it's important for that reason to focus on getting it right and, and maximizing um, the use of kids' time while they're in school. Um, so to really not shift the attention away from um, getting the core educational focus right and fixing that problem. Um, at the same time, it's important to think about innovative ways to um, address education um, from different perspectives. But I would say that um, it's, from my perspective, it's really important to focus on the main business of a lot of uh, governments um, and the biggest provider of education in a lot of settings, depending on the grade, but, um, and getting, figuring out how to get that right. Um, relatedly, the question about um, thinking about um, education for mothers, uh, that is especially important because in some places, you actually the, the law says that if you get pregnant, you have to leave school and you can't eat. So that's a starting point is like, first of all, um, making sure that um, systemically uh, school governments or education systems recognize um, that women should be or girls should be allowed to continue their education even if they get pregnant. With, and in, in that age, a lot of the times it's not within, it's not fully within their control whether or not they get pregnant. Um, so I think that's an important starting point, but there is a lot of work around that, trying to um, find ways to get women, girls enrolled in school. And on the STEM question, um, are there, if you read education policy documents across, I mean, nearly everyone I read has some target for gender breakdown of female representation in STEM. Um, so there is that on paper. Uh, and, but then in a lot of places, the numbers have been stuck for a long time. So I think going from, there, it's clearly on the policy radar in a lot of places, and there are um, policy documents or aspirations, goals for getting um, increased female representation in STEM. Um, but I think there's a big gap between what's on paper and what's actually happening in schools to get there. Can I make two points? Take back off of that because I don't, don't want to miss an opportunity to plug some people who are in the room too. Um, but on your point on the um, uh, you know policy opportunities to get um, uh, young girls who have already had a child to go back into school, we have one particular fellow who has um, since left our program, but uh, we consider her an alumni. She um, is situated in, in Jamaica and then works in the um, Ministry of Education there and has been really focused on how to actually implement an existing policy that is focused on reintegrating school-aged mothers back into the system and to incorporate all of these other different um, uh, sort of component parts that need to be in place with that program. So not only thinking about how do you um, create a, a, a well-financed system for early childhood uh, education and care, child care centers so that those mothers can go back into a reintegration program, but then also thinking about what are the actual skills that the, that the mother not only needs to attain in terms of um, whatever she's not learning in school, so the actual you know literacy, numeracy, science, and whatnot, but beyond that, those broader life skills um, that will help prevent a second pregnancy. I think there's oftentimes that, that uh, secondary attention to not only how do you reintegrate, but how do you prevent another pregnancy. Um, so there is that one. And then I also want to, on the STEM question, um, we, also, we have a scholar here who is in the room, um, one of our fellows um, in the back, Nas uh, Nasreen um, Siddiqua there, um, who's looking at that STEM question specifically in the context of rural Bangladesh. So I would encourage you to connect with her at the end. So, sorry, I just want to plug that. No, no, perfect. Uh, last time I talked to you, Stephanie, you, you were like really on a mission about uh, <laughs> literacy for adolescent mothers. Yes. Um, that seemed to be related to these things. Yes, thank you. I was going to say we can't move on until we can jump in on that <laughs> question. Um, and I will also quickly answer the, the methods question. Um, so a couple of things. One thing that I think it's real, is really important to say um, in the context of pregnancy and schooling is that it's not a random event. So the girls who become pregnant are selective in important ways. They tend to be the more vulnerable girls. So you can look at data from a few years earlier before the pregnancy occurred and see that their school performance tends to be worse even before that. They are from poorer households. They repeated early grades of school. So um, that means that the interventions, you know, just passing out contraception is not going to do the job and also um, getting them back into school is sometimes going to be very challenging because they already are in these more difficult circumstances. Um, the other thing I, I would like to say about that is that we um, have a study that's coming out in the next few weeks where we looked at the effect of childbearing right after leaving school on literacy and numeracy skills. So there's been a lot of 
increasingly, more recently, a lot of focus on the effects of pregnancy on dropout, um, but much less on the effect of pregnancy and childbearing on skills. And um, what we found in Bangladesh, Malawi, and Zambia is that having a birth within a couple of years of leaving school led to a deterioration in literacy and numeracy skills. Um, and that is very concerning, more bad news, unfortunately. But um, I think part of the challenge is that the skills are pretty tenuous to begin with in poor quality school settings. Um, and this event is a very disruptive event. So I think it's really important to be paying attention to what's happening right after leaving school, which is almost always a, a quick transition to motherhood. Um, just quickly on the causality question, and um, there's an 8,000 word paper with your name on it that you are <laughs> welcome to look at in detail. But um, I'll just say that so we, so we limited our inclusion to randomized controlled trials and then quasi-experimental studies that were able to construct counterfactuals so that you can compare and, and say that exposure to education was kind of a random event. So we have these criteria that we use, and it means that we eliminated a lot of studies that say something kind of interesting about these relationships but don't really get to the core of that question in our view. But it is also sort of an opinion matter. I mean. To some extent, it's also an empirical question um, of what counts as strong enough evidence of causality. So I'm sure different people would have different views on that. OK. Um, since I know the World Bank recently suspended a $300 million loan in Tanzania for this policy of <laughs> excluding pregnant girls, I'm glad that we had a World Bank economist, I think, reinstate the, I'm not sure. Uh, we won't hold you to a policy statement there, huh? <laughs> um, OK, why don't we turn back uh, for another round. Um, I'm getting a time signal. So if, if our answers are that long, we may, we may get one more healthy-sized mm. round here. So here in the blue, and then up front in white, and then in row two here. Hi, my name is Rihanna Raza, and I'm at the Urban Institute. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask Pamela a question, actually, because you've looked at this historical data set. And I'm wondering what thought you give or looked at. Or did you look at structural forces? I mean, because you see such a universal shift in this narrowing of gender gaps in education. And what thoughts, I mean, whether you examined it or had any thoughts on that, and particularly in light of when you think of, um, in, in sort of answering the question of this event of beyond education and looking at labor market outcomes and the differential outcomes we've seen in China and India, for instance, for women in labor force participation. So thinking about that. So I don't know if I answered my question, but I've got my question. OK. And the gentleman on the front row? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Ted from the International Center for Research on Women. Um, I wanted to ask Pamela and anyone else on the panel, when you're talking about life skills interventions and sort of the shaky evidence one way or the other about how successful they are, what do we know about the nuts and bolts of those individual interventions and the most successful ones and the least successful ones? What exactly are they doing with their students? Because when I read life skills and intervention, there's such a wide range of what that could be or ways of approaching it. I just want to have a better idea of what kind of nuances you see there. And then in white, the second row. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Anna. I'm a recent graduate of the International Institute of Social Studies, where I have a degree in development studies. I focus on gender conflict and human rights. This is really interesting. Thank you for having us this afternoon. Um, I have a question that I'm still trying to formulate, but I feel like it's kind of been an adjacent theme to, every, to a number of things that you've been speaking on this afternoon, which is, um, I first thought about it when you brought up the idea of like considering cost as an access or a barrier to access for education. I was wondering if you could speak to how you, or how some of the research um, considers time as a cost. Uh, and then how that can also be related to, we were speaking about life skills earlier, and whether or not, or how those are being then taught to boys as well, which we were also speaking about. Um, and how those are kind of all integrated both within access to the labor market, but also in contribution to what economists may often view as unpaid or invisible labor. And I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. All right, should we go ahead and take that round? Um, I don't know if you want to kick off, Pam, with uh, the structural forces underlying the big trends you showed us. <coughs> sure. I mean, I think, uh, you know, in many of the countries in the data set, there was a big push after, early on after independence. And there was a long kind of economic boom period in the 1960s up until the oil crisis where there was a lot of 
international money going into funding education. So right, the Marshall Plan had been successful in Europe. This is the sort of era of development being very overconfident about its ability to eliminate poverty in our lifetime. And a lot of investment went into building schools and expanding access. And in many regions with low access to begin with, that was targeted at boys. And so I think there's more uniformity in what countries did in terms of educational interventions, starting from a very low base over the 60s and 70s and 80s, than there is in other things like the labor markets. I think labor markets are, to some extent, more varied. And so that, you know, it's reasonable that we see much more difference in terms of women's labor force participation than we see in these trajectories. Um, I mean, I think the cases of India and China are interesting because we've seen, you know, India has had a relatively persistent gap in uh, women's educational attainment, though now if you look at the new UNESCO e-atlas that just came out, it says that boys are disadvantaged because girls' enrollment has caught up. Uh, in terms of labor force participation in both India and China, over the last 20 years, women's labor force participation has actually been going down as boys make more money. And so I think that the structural factors, I mean, I could talk about specific cases like what happened in Kenya or what's happened in, in, in India, but I think the structural factors tend to vary a lot when we think about the relationship with the labor market or trends in fertility. We see a lot of variation across uh, different countries, but we see much more kind of homogeneity in terms of the big push to expand schooling that happened in the 60s and 70s, and then was to some extent curtailed with the cutbacks in the structural adjustment era. And now we've seen another kind of big push, and it has been pretty effective in increasing attainment, if not school quality. Um, in terms of this question about uh, the components of life skills, no, I think that's exactly right. And so this goes back to the notion that life skills broadly defined, at least something that looks like life skills, are very important. But a question is, how do we teach people life skills? Is it even possible to teach people life skills? And when we start including these kind of, like what economists call non-cognitive skills, these soft skills that might develop early in childhood that are shaped by your family background, it's much harder to, to think about whether we can even influence them. And then I think, as with vocational education, there's also a danger of once life skills becomes the buzzword, then a lot of programs include a life skills component that may be relatively low test. So it could be that very high intensity, very locally appropriate, contextually specific interventions that are very costly to administer might achieve something. And yet a lot of things that are billed as life skills interventions are much lighter touch and much less <coughs> successful. And I think there hasn't been as much you know, often these things are being run, there, it's a horse race between a life skills thing and another active labor market program. So then there isn't necessarily scope to say, well, which is the piece of this life skills training that's really critical? And so I think we don't know as much as we might like to about what is really successful, what are the proven elements of these kind of broadly soft or life skills, what are things that seem to work less, and what does the intensity need to be to actually achieve lasting change in different populations? Right. Can I, can I yeah, build off of that again? And not to yeah. always jump off of your no, life skills fine. comments. Um, but I think the life skills discussion branches into a really important discussion around broader quality of education, right? Um, I think you, you mentioned a little bit about teaching life skills to boys and, and that sort of thing. So um, I think it, you know, I think part of the issue with life skills is that we think about them way too narrowly, right? It's a particular kind of skill. It's almost, almost a vocational skill in some context and in other contexts as a skill out of context. Um, meaning, you know, teaching communication skills in a particular uh, safe space setting, but how do you then apply that communication skill in another comp more complex um, setting where it's not safe, where power and um, uh, norms are, are dictating sort of um, the, the, the circumstances. So I think when we think about life skills education, that leads us and that challenges us to take up the bigger question around what is the quality of education. And I think our limited kind of narrow focus on literacy and numeracy gets us outside of thinking about how does education teach us about self-awareness, social awareness, and ecological awareness. And I think that will really help us tackle some of these complex interrelated problems that are interlinked with gender equality and inequality in education. So thinking about how does life skills teach us about, you know, not only to understand our own kind of, um, you know, ability to problem solve or critically think about something, but also think about the social awareness and the social emotional skills that allow us to see how, how to react or to read an audience or to read a, a, read a room, read a circumstance, navigate particular kinds of choices. 
And I think if, we, if we're not thinking about that broader question around the quality of education, our life skills conversation is going to continue to be as narrow and limited as, you know, how do you teach the ABCs or the, you know, whatever, however that translates in another context. Um, so I just wanted to put that plug in there as well in terms of thinking about quality of education as well. Anyone want to come in on time as a cost? I, I figured a time use survey. Pam, you couldn't look at me. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't want to. <laughs> somebody else can go first. Here. I'll, uh, I'll jump in on that. So we mentioned that this morning, and that's um, something that comes up a lot uh, more broadly when we think about even with the, the uh, uh, segregation in occupational choice. Um, the fact that women tend to have, or even girls tend to have, a higher burden of care work and household responsibilities. Uh, and so it's not just a question, there is an opportunity cost of going to school. So it's not just the financial cost of paying for school fees and paying for books and whatever else. There's also the fact that when they're not in school, in a lot of cases, women and girls tend to be um, doing the brunt of the housework and unpaid labor within the household. Uh, and so that's why uh, things like uh, conditional cash transfers or cash transfers, just cash or micro access to micro or just giving cash to households and to young girls themselves sometimes um, is a compliment, maybe a useful compliment to a push for enrollment in education um, because it is unrealistic to expect households to um, shift girls into school um, without somehow compensating for the lost time. And so this question arises, where does this come from? It could be, I like the point you made earlier, Pam, that when we think about infrastructure related to education, we often think about building schools, um, but it could be like electrification electrification, which allows um, the automation of a lot of uh, tasks that women traditionally do, or access to improved access to water, um, changes in uh, cooking uh, technologies. Um, so those types of things address this question of, of cost in, in terms of time. Um, but that's something that is a really important thing to think about, because in most cases, it's a very gender thing, how people spend their time. Final comments, Dana, Stephanie? Yeah, I think maybe I'll just play devil's advocate a little bit in the life skills conversation. I mean, m much of the work we do, all of the work we do at Population Council includes life skills education and a big focus on comprehensive sexuality education. But I think that especially in the areas where the evidence is thinner, um, we have to be very clear about what our goals are when resources are limited. Um, and you know we're talking about education systems where a lot of young people spend five, six, seven years and come out and can't read two sentences, um, you know, or do simple addition or subtraction. So I think it's really, and I know that this work is very much ongoing in this space, but I think it's really important to be clear about what the skills are that are the most important skills for young people to come out of school with or come out of you know, adolescence or whatever it is to enter into adulthood, um, to have healthy and productive adulthoods. And, and the reality of the situation right now is that we can't do everything and governments can't do everything and ministries of finance can't do everything. And, and so I think we also have to um, just be very explicit about what the goals are and what, and you know, not just about whether something works and, you know, is statistically significantly associated with the outcome, but whether it is the most effective way to achieve the goal given the resources that we have. I mean, I would just add on that, uh, that the problem with life skills right now is you ask 10 different people what is life skills and you're going to get 10 different answers, right? So we're in a very convoluted space in terms of actually sorting out some of those questions and be able to answer um, yeah. your provocative point about what, you know, what should we prioritize. So, mm -hmm. All right. We're nearing the end here. I <laughs> want to thank all of our panelists um, for a really rich discussion. We covered a lot of ground. Um, we, the objective of the day was to throw out more questions than answers, and I think we did that. But we're, I hope we're pushing on to a new generation of, of questions and moving them forward. Um, thank you to all of you for being here and for your questions to keep the session going, and we hope to see you back uh, in the future at future CGD events. Let's say another round of applause for our panelists. Yeah.